the title of this talk is is getting rid of bias in decision making it really has two meanings the first reflects what we were hoping to do with the project when we got started we were hoping that we would be able to discover sort of general understanding of how bias works why bias occurs in decisions um, but it also reflects essentially the conclusion which i will hopefully convince you of which is that that it's not a particularly useful concept as a general concept in decision making. This is a rather frustrated um, uh, version of a story, perhaps. All right, let me see. I have to click there. All right. So when I talk about bias, and I, I just suspect it's something most people are familiar with, the idea would be that there's some expectation about how you should behave in order to be called accurate. Um, when you make mistakes, they're either noisy in the sense that they are scattered variably around, um, uh, but on average accurate um, versus biased, which is where there may not necessarily be a lot of variability in how you're behaving, but it's very consistent um, and consistently wrong in a sense. So in this bottom left corner, this uh, it's not there. Yeah. In this bottom left corner, the idea of systematically wrong, but not necessarily noisy kinds of responding. So that's the sort of very general concept of bias. The way that we studied it in the lab was just by making participants do make very, very simple decisions. And so here you might get a, a stimulus composed of uh, black and white circles, and your job might be as simple as deciding, are there more black or more white circles in this display? And then responding, it's a dark or a bright stimulus, um, respectively. And the idea is that you can get a sense of how biased someone is by looking at how often they respond dark to a stimulus that has more black circles, how often they respond dark to a stimulus that has more white circles, and to the extent that both are increasing or decreasing, then you are biased. You're responding essentially more or less independently of the, of the stimulus. We'll, we'll at least operationally define bias that way, certainly for, for tasks like the one I just described. So some of the very first and sort of still prominent um, sort of accounts or theories of bias, uh, is the signal detection account. The basic idea is you would get some feeling of how dark a stimulus like the one I showed you was, uh, and then you would compare that impression of darkness to some criterion. And if it exceeded the criterion, you would say dark. If it was below, you would say bright. And in that sense, a bias is simply the, position, rel the, posi the relative positioning of that criterion against which you compare your impression of brightness or darkness. And so you can move that criterion around, make it more or less easy to say dark or bright. Um, but I'm not going to spend too much time on or any more time on signal detection. I want to focus on uh, a sort of a, essentially a dynamic extension of signal detection theory. This is these response time or evidence accumulation models. Um, and basically the idea is you're, you're presented with a stimulus like um, the one on screen there, and you have to decide dark or bright. The idea is that you will sample information from this image. That information will be used as evidence either to as a dark response or for a bright response. But the idea is that moment to moment, you sample this information and it's variable. So you might get this, you'll track that evidence. Um, and the idea is that at some point, you'll have so much evidence for one of the two responses that you'll make a response. And this models how often this happens, that you'll hit the dark boundary or the light, uh, the bright boundary reflects your sort of the proportion of choices that you'll make. And the time it takes for that to happen is a, is a model of the time it takes to make responses. Right. And so I'm going to talk about it just really only there's, there's a few parameters in this model. I'm going to focus almost entirely on just two, really just one. And that's the most important one for this talk with this drift rate parameter. And that just simply refers to the average rate at which this evidence accumulates. So if we are looking at a stimulus, for example, that does have more black circles than white circles, then on average, the information and the evidence you get will point towards that dark threshold. And so on average, the accumulation will be in this sort of positive um, direction. The more black circles are there, the faster that will, that will happen, the, the stronger the drift rate will be. So the more quickly evidence will accumulate towards that dark response threshold. And indeed, if there's more white circles, you start to head down towards that bottom um, threshold. So 
bias in these models, basically there's two forms of bias uh, according to these models. The first is in another parameter in the model, which is called the start point of, of evidence accumulation. And so in this picture at the moment, the start point is halfway between the two response thresholds. And this is essentially unbiased because at the start of the decision, you think there's, there's no evidence or pre-existing evidence for one response over the other. But if you were to shift the start point up towards perhaps the dark boundary, then you're essentially beginning the trial as if you believed already that one response was more likely than the other. And so we can think of this as a sort of prior bias. And the consequence of that will be that you'll be faster to respond um, with that biased response. Uh, the other response will take longer when you do make it. You'll also be more likely to make that um, response. So this is the, the first kind of bias in these models. There's a second kind, however, and that's a drift rate bias. And so the idea here would be, so say we have this stimulus that let's say is more black circles than white circles and therefore has a drift um, positive with some strength. The idea would be that you could create a stimulus that was the opposite in its property. So it was, if, it had, if the top one has 36 black circles, then you could make a stimulus with 36 white circles. And the idea would be that if you are unbiased in your evidence accumulation, then these two drifts should be symmetrical about zero. So they, they should be, yeah. So that if you average the two drift rates, you would get zero um, reflecting the fact that they, yeah, that the same stimulus would evoke information or evidence in opposite directions to the same extent. Maybe just a good question. Like, so in, the, in, a, in this, maybe this is just an example, right? But you have like a spatial stimulus and you have high movements and the distribution of things might matter and stuff like that. Does that come into any of these considerations? So the, yeah, this would be, this is a very in principle uh, argument. Yeah, the, the actual physicality of it will of course depend on the stimulus and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, so no, it is very much a in principle, this is what's supposed to happen. The, you would know that things were unbiased if the average of the two drift rates were was zero, let's say. And so you can have then, of course, a, a bias in that evidence accumulation process by having asymmetrical drift rates or the average of these two drift rates not being zero, being positive or negative. Right. So yeah, diffusion models have two kinds of bias. And what we were trying to do is to understand these things get observed in experiments to different extents. Some experiments evoke start point bias, some evoke drift rate bias. Um, and we're, we were trying to understand why, when, how does this, uh, how does this happen? And so typically the drift rate bias gets explained as a stimulus, uh, it kind of gets characterized as a stimulus evaluation kind of bias. So in the sense that the same stimulus is just simply being evaluated differently. You're, you're using the information that you get from the stimulus in such a way that it gives you more evidence for one response over another. Um, so perhaps equally dark and bright stimuli in a physical sense will perhaps produce a biased um, accumulation for darkness because we may have a perceptual system that is inclined to see things as dark, whatever, or depending on the contrast and the background and so on. But the basic idea is that drift bias was, has historically been thought of as stimulus evaluation. Right. And so what we sought out was to just sort of test this idea. We ran this first experiment that I'll tell you about, participant see a fixation cross, a mask, a stimulus is flashed up, another mask. They are then asked, bright or dark? What did you see or what, what do you think? Uh, and then they receive feedback as to whether that response was correct or incorrect. We have two manipulations in the um, experiment besides sort of whether the stimulus is bright or dark or has more black or more white circles. The first is an, in, is an attempt to induce bias, which is we manipulate how often within a block of trials you see Black, black dominant stimuli or white dom dominant stimuli. So sometimes you'll be in a sitting in a block of 100 trials where 30 of them will be bright and, and 70 will be dark. There'll be a 50-50 and 70-30. And then the other manipulation, which is to try and get at this role of stimulus in drift bias, was this manipulation of presentation length. So between the two masks, we manipulated how long the stimulus was visible on screen. And it went from as long as 200 milliseconds all the way down to zero milliseconds. So we would literally flash the mask, uh, the forwards and the backwards mask, and, and then ask them, what do you think, dark or bright, right? And of course, this is impossible for the participants, but that was also kind of the point. So I'm gonna jump straight to model parameters, not 
response times and accuracy and things like that. I'm just going to go straight to the parameters because that's what we're going to do for every experiment. Um, so these are the start point parameters of the diffusion model. So we, we, we take the data, we fit the response times and choices using a hierarchical Bayesian version of this diffusion model. And we get from that these parameters for each of the different conditions. Um, so these are all the different presentation time conditions and the different bias blocks, we'll call them, um, or at least on this slide, we'll call them the different relative proportion of trials. And so what we're seeing here, the green, let's focus just on the green so the points for a second. But this is when there's an equal number of dark and bright trials within a block of trials for all the different presentation lengths. And the idea would be 0.5 is equivalent to starting your accumulation halfway between the dark and the bright response boundaries. Right? And so that would be sort of unbiased. And you can see it's kind of around there. If anything, it's maybe a little bit, if you average across, mentally average across all these different conditions, maybe there's a slight bias towards saying dark. But the point is there's a bit of, you know, the red things seem to be on top, followed by the green things, followed by the blue things. And that's sort of just a demonstration that there is bias in the way people responded. So they, when you gave them more dark stimuli in a block, they pressed dark more often and they pressed dark faster than they pressed bright and so on. So there's this evocation of bias in the start points. The start points aren't really the interesting part of this story though, because as you can see, there's not really very much systematically going on across the different conditions. More interesting are the, are the drift rates. So here I'm just showing you quickly the, in the longest presentation time condition that we have, the 200 milliseconds, you see a dark stimulus evokes a positive rate and a bright stimulus evokes uh, a negative rate. They look roughly symmetrical, about zero. There's not a lot going on there. The interesting thing that happens is as presentation time gets short, as you might expect, the, these, uh, these basically come converge to be the same value, right? Because essentially down here with the shortest presentation times, you're showing a mask, you're showing a stimulus for so quickly that people can't see what's there. Uh, and then you're asking them, what did you see? And so they can't tell the difference as to whether or not what, what the properties of the actual stimuli were. Of course not. And indeed, if you show them absolutely nothing, they have this, this rate very close to zero. May I ask a question? Yep. Um, so it seems there's something a little bit strange about this in terms of drift rate. If, you're, if you believe the model, and there may be a, like a start time that they don't have enough time to accumulate any data, but the drift rate should actually be completely constant. The way the model works, right? So this is a really a reflection of the fact that your that your your model doesn't take account of a non-decision time early somehow, but then it's too short for them to get to going on the um, stimuli. Yeah, it basically models the process as a non-decision time, and then a yes, it doesn't have like a what would be going on if you didn't have anything to decide about. Yeah. Oh, keep that in mind though, because I'll get to it when we look at the bias conditions because that's a potential explanation for what happens in, in some of those conditions too. Right. Um, right. So, so this is just, sorry, this is just when the black and white stimuli are equally um, often presented. Maybe one follow-up question. So I, I was wondering a bit with the presentation duration, is the assumption that what is sample is perceptual representations or what exactly is that is being sampled and where is it sampled into or who is sampling? Yeah, we're getting right into the nuts and bolts of a diffusion model. The idea, typically speaking, is that essentially like this, that this is based on experiments done in the 60s where you just flash a stimulus up and then ask people to respond. Essentially, the idea is that some internal representation is being held and then the evidence accumulation process happens on that. So as long as it's long enough to be in memory, uh, to, to have reached some kind of sensory memory, uh, then you continue to sample until you're happy to decide based on that. Because basically what happens is you, you reach asymptote here pretty quickly. And then no matter how much longer the stimulus is up for performance doesn't get any better. This, this maxes out because it's hard to tell whether there are more dark or more black or white circles in the image, as opposed to if I really, or, I mean, you could count, but if you didn't count, this is kind of what you can get from looking at the stimulus. Right, so this is just the unbiased condition. The, I'm going to show you now, this is what happens in the, in the block of trials where there are more dark stimuli, let's say, right? And so what you can see is starting at the sort of right side of the plot, uh, things are shifted up. So because they're sitting in a block where there are more dark stimuli, everything is, evidence is accumulated as if things were darker than they actually are, let's say, relative to the unbiased condition at the very least. The sort of interesting thing that happens though, is that this persists down when you're not showing them the stimulus at all. 
Right? So if the idea is that drift bias is supposed to be a stimulus evaluation thing, well, this is still showing plenty of bias when there's no stimulus to, to evaluate. And that's, that was surprising. We didn't think this would happen. We thought these, this would basically drop down to zero um, for these very short presentation time conditions. How identifiable is this compared to the um, start condition, the start point? Hang on one second. Sorry. Okay. Yes, Peter? How identifiable is this relative to the change in start point? So the, the parameters are independently identifiable enough that if you simulate data, it recovers one parameter change over another. So if you, if you simulate data where you genuinely have a start point change or a drift rate change, it'll pick it up um, precisely enough. It, it seems to recover parameters in this kind of design. Is that what you're asking? Yes, yeah, so there's no and there's no correlation or or there's no uh, in the in, in the inference uh, there's no correlation in this. Uh, um... There's there's not to the point where that would explain what's going on here. Mm -hmm. There's okay. enough independent conditions where you fix certain parameters constant across the different conditions. So if you um, so for example, the the threshold parameters in this model is are set constant across the different presentation time conditions, and that's generally enough that even though the model itself would have correlation between parameters that tends to be those kinds of things like fixing non-decision time, fixing uh, boundary separation tends to be enough to make the parameters identifiable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And indeed, if you if you literally re simulate the sort of des the design, it recovers this. Yeah. Same question. Okay. <laughs> All right. So just to, to make these graphs simpler, because I'll show you a lot of graphs that look like this. Um, we'll just average the bright and the dark stimuli to get this measure of bias. So in the unbiased condition here, where there's 50-50 dark bright, you get basically zero as the drift uh, as the drift bias parameters. And indeed, if you um, average the drift rates uh, for the other conditions, I think this quite nicely shows what was so unexpected about um, what happened in this experiment, right? The longer the presentation length, the less drift rate bias there was, which really seemed to go against the idea of drift bias being this evaluation of stimuli. So that, that was a surprising claim, but we were worried, of course, as no doubt you are, about the zero millisecond, very short presentation length um, conditions there. It's weird, you don't usually do that, maybe something um, is odd about that. And so we wanted to try and reproduce the same basic kind of result um, with a different kind of design. So I'll show you that now. So what we did um, in this experiment, there are no, now the, the images are shown until the person is ready to respond. So they just come on, they stay there until you're ready to say, in this case, orange or blue. We change from black or white because of perceptual things that I think you're maybe even um, thinking about. People see things as darker than they are, so you don't get quite unbiased responding in the unbiased condition. So now it's blue and orange, it seems to be a little bit better. So now, and we're also going to manipulate the difficulty of the task, because what we thought is as the task gets harder, perhaps that's what was making the bias, uh, the drift rate bias larger. And so we have these, what we'll call un unamb unambiguous conditions, these, uh, hopefully it's clear that you're getting, it's getting harder and harder to tell whether these are orange or blue stimuli down, right down to the point where it's, I think it's actually 32 orange circles and 32 blue circles. So there's not even a correct answer in principle um, for this stimulus. And then we have that, we contrasted this with a condition where we essentially grade out some of the circles in the image. And this was supposed to be a proxy to the sort of not showing you the stimulus at all, here, we're just going to hide some of the information um, that you would normally use to make that decision as to whether this is mostly orange or mostly blue. We tell participants, there's, there's actually circles behind there. You just can't see them. You're supposed to respond as if you could have seen, could see what's there or what's really there underneath these hidden parts, um, but you can't know for sure what's there. And so essentially, so start points, not much going on there. There's something weird with that last condition, but it's not anything that has ever shown up in any other experiment. So we're not going to try and explain it. We'll just say this is a basic reproduction of that start point effect where if you manipulate the relative frequency of things, it that effect carries into, into these start point parameters. 
The more interesting thing is this drift rate bias effect. So again, here we're breaking it down by difficulty and whether or not the, all the information is there or whether some of it's missing. And indeed, it kind of looks like things are fanning out. So the, the drift rate bias is larger when the information is missing. And indeed, put all of the conditions up, it really does look like, again, we see that as this decision becomes more vague and hard to make, the drift rate bias, the effect of putting you in a block of more blue um, stimuli, causes you to accumulate essentially the absence of evidence as if it were um, more blue or more orange, depending on the block. Right. So this is, again, this is confusing. So a larger influence of bias when the task is more difficult or perhaps when the stimuli are more ambiguous. This was surprising. And then we found a really nice paper um, that actually predicted this. So this is a paper by Hanks et al. in 2001. And what they basically say is that if you are in a, you're in a decision-making environment and there's a mixture of easy trials and hard trials, let's say to make it simpler, then what you could notice, because what it, an empirical fact will be is that because the more difficult trials take you longer to make and the easier trials are nice and fast, if you notice that fact, then you can, you can, you can take advantage of the fact that the, the quicker you are, to make the, or, sorry, if you're still in a tr decision and it's, it's been a while, you're probably wrong. And so basically you should just respond and get out, All right? So if, if, you're in, if you're trying to make a decision, there are hard trials and easy trials. If you find yourself having taken a while, you, it's probably hard. So just don't worry about it. If you're being rational, let's say, don't, uh, don't wait, just respond and get out. And so then if there is a bias signal that you can, capitalize on. So if, for example, you're in a block of trials where there are more easy, uh, sorry, more orange or more blue, um, things are correct or incorrect, the idea should be that, well, you should ramp up that bias. So the later you find yourself in the decision, the more bias you should show. And this basically, I think, is one possible explanation of what happened in our experiment so far. May I ask you a question? Two quick ones. So for the ambiguous case, it would actually seem to be easier rather than more difficult, because all you can do is count the, the, the stimuli you see, you have fewer of them. Easy with respect to how to do it, harder with respect to trying to get the correct answer. But there's not, but in a way, but there's nothing, there's no way in which you can accumulate more. It's not, it's not harder in the sense that you, you thought about it harder or anything like that, there's any less information. Uh, yeah, I mean, you would have to say that we assume that there should be information, let's say, that, that you know why would they put me in a situation where I can't but absolutely yes it's given two 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 one one blue one orange right they this was a 50 50 but it's easy to count and the other question is indeed um in the Hanks world do they tend to do this by having a decreasing threshold rather than by an increasing bias that's another oh you would still need something you would still need a direction to point yourself in to get yeah, out because, it, because the threshold decreases then you're of course you're getting closer whichever your your above you're you're close to the to, to whichever one you are right so you become less um isn't that the way they, they would normally do it sure um the the additional thing going on here though is that this basically this this decision this uh sorry dynamic bias signal actually also just pushes you in a direction too so this is something you would add to a drift rate not just a collapsing threshold or an urgency signal or something like that so this so you're gonna have clear? both urgency and a dynamic bias Yes. So this is this is like for the situation like where you think like, oh, it's better to press this button if in doubt, you know, press this button or something like that. Like if, if one response was paid more or if it was more frequent, or like in our experiments, the idea would be this is added to whatever drift rate that you have in order to get you out of the decision more quickly, but in a particular direction. So like, you know, override whatever you're getting from the stimulus. I see. Yeah, so it is different from just urgency or collapsing bounds or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So this was this was very promising when we discovered um, this paper or realized that it had implications for our experiments. Um, and so, and indeed, uh, it, these plots are annoying. Just to, just look at the green thing. And the point is that the green line goes down. These are the empirical accuracy response curves that we get from the first experiment. And the idea would be 
yeah, as the decision gets longer, on average, people got worse. So they, there was some signal for the participants to notice in order to um, capitalize, in order to, to, to sort of uh, build in a bias, um, like Hank says they should. Hank said Alice say they should. And indeed, experiment two, it's, again, it's getting a little flat, but there's some signal there. So maybe this, we were slightly excited about this. It didn't really, it didn't turn out um, to work. And there's actually a, a lot of experiments showing it doesn't work, but I think this is one of the more convincing ones. And so in this experiment, it's exactly the same as the last one um, that I told you about, except that we removed all trial to trial feedback as to whether you were correct or incorrect. So in this experiment, you, you really, there's some initial practice with the task, um, but then after that, you're just let to go. Um, you're told about the block manipulation. So you're in a block of trials where there are more orange than um, blue, or there's 50-50 or the other way around. Um, and it's true. Right? So that's all there, but there's no feedback. And indeed, again, just looking at the green curve, there's a huge accuracy response time relationship. So if you're a participant in this task, you know that if I'm, if I'm taking more than a second, I'm, I'm probably not going to be very accurate. You're not being told whether you're correct or incorrect, but if you have some initial in, in, internal impression of that, um, then yeah, you should know that you're going to be inaccurate. But this experiment is the only one we've ever run where there was absolutely no effect of the frequency manipulation at all. So the empirical the, every, every representation of the empirical data we could come up with, like looking at accuracy, drift rates, start points, response times, they are practically identical for the three orange biased, unbiased, and um, blue biased conditions. It's really, they just didn't respond to the manipulation at all. They just responded completely in line with, you can take this as, they responded in, completely in line with what the stimulus showed them. So if there was more blue, they said blue. If there was more orange, they said orange. And that was all they seemed to do in this experiment. Again, the, the sort of the lack of, um, and so again, Hank's explanation says there should be a huge amount of dynamic bias signal and there's none. Um, we had another version of this experiment, but now where you give feedback on the trials that are unambiguous, leaving these um, with no feedback. And uh, again, we see a very nice um, accuracy uh, response time curve. So the longer you're in the decision, the more the the less accurate you will be. And again, we get this time we get a start point bias. So there's a small, basically a small effect of this manipulation of the the relative frequency of trials. But in terms of the drift rates, it's, there's really nothing going on. And again, that, that was surprising. That was sort of, there's also, we have, I don't have time to show you, I guess, but there's, there's a few other experiments where we get, managed to make tasks where the longer you stay in the decision, the more accurate, accurate you are. And in those cases, you still show these large drift rate bias effects for the worst performing conditions. And so it really, this, this, uh, the Hanks et al, as nice as it was, it just didn't seem to come out. So you could, can you just say, so how does that, how do you set up the experiment so you get the inverse relationship? Oh God. So once the first time on accident, we just had a stimulus with nine images. They're sort of um, pound signs or ampersands or something like that. And the problem was that people could count. So the longer they were in the trial, the more accurate they were. But when there was still missing information, there's sort of ambiguous trials in there that still caused them to be, to show more drift rate bias um for those conditions compared to the ones where you could see all the images right so we were kind of stuck so we think there's still something going on where people are essentially accumulating i uh, call this external factor but where they're still accumulating their expectation the prior almost as if it were evidence um it's not Perhaps it's not because of the reason that Hanks um, et al. said it was, because you know that the longer you take, the, the less accurate you'll be. But it still does seem like that's what they're doing. The, the, in the absence of evidence from a stimulus, they're using their expectation to drive their decision. Um, but then the question was, was why? What's going on? Yeah. And so what we realized, of course, was these feedback experiments that could turn the bias on or off or amplify it. Um, that maybe it's not so much actually this ambiguous and unambiguous thing as much as it is 
uh, the feedback that we provide. So I intentionally left it out. Sometimes people ask, uh, it's lucky that no one asked this time, but perhaps some people are already thinking about this. How did we reinforce this ambiguous condition where there's information missing? And the feedback is going to turn out, we thought maybe for a while, we thought it was about ambiguity, the sort of meta level um, thinking about the task, but it really seems it's about feedback. And so what we did was we redid the experiments that I was just telling you about, but where the participants always see the full display. So they always see all of the blue and orange circles, but we just had three conditions manipulating the feedback they received. So when I talk about feedback, what I'm going to mention, what I'm going to talk about here is how often when you see, for example, an orange stimulus, how often are you told orange is the correct answer? Because that turns out to have been confounded in the ambiguous conditions. Because to sort of explain that, here, most of the orange that you see, uh, most of the circles you see are orange, but sometimes you're told blue is the correct answer. That's going to matter. But here we didn't want to have missing information. We just made the relationship between the stimulus and what you were told was the correct answer um, not always perfectly related. So we still had this condition where the stimulus and the response you should give are perfectly deterministically related. So 100% of the time when it's orange, you're supposed to say orange, even when it's really, really hard, you're still supposed to, I think there's one circle difference between blue and orange, but you're still, it's always true what you're being told as feedback. This is, uh, I'm just showing you now the neutral, the unbiased condition. We had another condition that was the same as what we used to call unambiguous, but now the stimuli are unambiguous. Uh, we used to call this ambiguous. Now the stimuli are completely unambiguous, but now it's almost probabilistic feedback is another way of talking about it. So the more orange the stimulus is, the more often you're told orange is the correct response, but it's now or it is only 70% of the time. Sometimes you see this and you're told blue is the correct response. And then we had another condition where we made the stimulus and the response that you should give or the feedback completely independent. So the stimulus on the screen had absolutely nothing to do with what you should, how you should respond. It was literally in the 50-50 block where there's an equal number of orange and blue. It was, you just had to press one of the two buttons randomly. Right. And so we still had these blue and orange biased blocks. The relationship between the stimulus and the feedback in the deterministic condition is still 100%. They're pushed around a little bit in the probabilistic version. So if you're in a block where mostly you should say orange, then if it was more orange, you were more likely to have to say orange. Um, but the important thing here is this unrelated condition where what you see is really just doesn't matter. You're just it's just if you're in a block where there's more orange than blue, you should just press orange. Indeed, if you were maximizing, if you wanted to get the most correct responses, you should just press orange like every single trial. It's almost like a classic probability matching experiment. It's also very weird when you're showing them these stimuli. Right. So in terms of what happens, I'm not going to show you the start points. They do the same thing as every other picture. They, there's a slight start point bias effect. What's more interesting are these drift rate biases. So in the deterministic condition, you get a relatively small drift rate bias effect. It doesn't seem to be related to difficulty at all. Um, this kind of looks like what we were seeing before for ambiguous. But the probabilistic condition, yeah, this is how we kind of realized, oh, it's not about ambiguity. It's about feedback. It's about the fact that we, we tell you, uh, when you see an orange stimulus, sometimes we tell you that oh, that's blue. And that completely messes with people. And what we expect to see in the unrelated condition is essentially sort of no effect of, of difficulty here, but really large drift rate bias effects. However, what we saw in the experiment was behavior that's basically exactly the same as in the probabilistic condition. So in the experiment, in the, when participants are doing this task, and there's absolutely no relationship between the stimuli and what response they should give, they respond as if there's some loose relationship or some moderate relationship between the stimulus and the response. So that was very surprising. So here's another way of looking at it. We're just going to go back to choice proportions because that sort of shows what's going on. We sort of had to drop drift rate bias as a particularly useful way of representing this and go back to just how are people responding? So what we're looking at here is as we go across the plots, 
there's more blue in the display. And the y-axis is just how often you say blue. Um, and so you can see in the deterministic condition, there's, the, 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 there's a nice clean relationship between how much blue there is in the image and how often you say blue. The separation here is that small bias effect. Um, that's, that's, that is the effect of being in a block where there's more blue than orange. It does affect how often you choose blue and orange, but not as large as here. But the surprising thing is, right, in terms of reality, there's a straight blue line here and a straight orange line here and a straight black line. In reality, in terms of the reinforcement they receive, there's no relationship. So these should be just flat lines. And indeed, the only reason these two things kind of look a little different with this graph is because there's a two or three participants who realized what was going on and did respond with straight lines. And then you average those in. This is just to not remove them, just to leave them in to show there's not that many of them. But you take them out, and these two are, are practically identical. Even individuals look like these graphs, too. So this was very surprising because, yeah, feedback usually matters. So again, we sort of thought, we thought we were onto something because in that, in, in the probabilistic condition, we thought, oh, it's feedback that really matters. But it didn't completely matter. It didn't matter for that, un, for that unrelated condition, right? Except for the small number of people who, who, who did realize what was going on. And indeed, we actually asked them afterwards, uh, what did you use to, to make your decisions? Did you use the stimulus or did you use this base rate information we gave them? Not in those words, but we had some story for it. And they told us, especially these guys, they said, I didn't use the stimulus at all. I just use this 70%, 30% thing. But there weren't very many of them. And that's why the, there's not that much difference between the probabilistic and unrelated conditions. All right, so what's going on here? And I think, so here's my story. Oh, yeah. Okay. And so was this a between or within subject design? Good question. I took out a slide here that explained that. So what I'm showing you is essentially a between subjects design because we ran it as a within subjects design, um, but this is just the first block. So it's the first, the first thing they see. They either see the deterministic or probabilistic or unrelated. And the reason that we had to use it essentially like between subjects is because Anyone who had, if you had been in the probabilistic or unrelated conditions, that's how you behaved for the rest of the experiment. Even when you transferred over into the deterministic condition, they would no longer go back to being deterministic like they were spoiled essentially because, yeah, something had been broken. Right. And how many trials do they have to go through? They do one block of each of the bias conditions and they do it. I think it's like 90 trials per person, and there's about 40, 50 people in these experiments. So here's my attempt to explain what's going on. So I think the key is actually in that no feedback condition. So literally where you just say, go, oh, do this task without giving them feedback as to what the correct response is. And what they do is they tell you what they see. So what I think that tells us is that if you don't know what to do in this task, you just look at the image. How, is there more blue? Is there more orange? If there's more blue or more orange, you press that button. It corresponds with that. That seems fairly simple. And I think what happens is that in these probabilistic and unrelated conditions, or in our old ambiguous conditions and so on, it reveals a problem with your approach. Because you see something that's very clearly orange or very clearly blue, and you press that button, and then you receive the feedback, no, you're wrong. Right. And so that approach that you want to take by default or whatever, like the way that you best explain the environment that you find yourself in within the no feedback condition is clearly problematic. Because I thought I could just say, you know, difficult trials present a little bit of a problem, but you can explain it away by saying, ah, I really couldn't tell if there were more orange or blue. But when you see those images that are very clearly orange or blue, you know that they were orange or blue, and yet you're still told, no, you're wrong. And so I think that reveals a problem, but it doesn't tell you what you should do. So you have to just guess what's going on in the experiment. And most people don't guess. They don't go as far to hypothesize or conjecture that the stimulus is completely irrelevant. Only a couple of people do. And that's why only a couple of people show that effect. And most people can't get there. They can tell that there's a disconnect between the stimulus and the response, but they don't because they don't guess that we would go as far to make them independent, they don't realize it, and therefore they don't behave as if they realize it. 
which I think it's treated as unreliable, but it's probably pretty hard to make that final step to sort of say that it's real. A hundred percent. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Right. And so this is kind of where our thinking about this whole project really started to almost fall apart. But it definitely changed, right? So what we thought was, well, the way people are deciding in these decision environments depends on their hypotheses about how the environment works. And so one thing that we thought would be fun to do would be to just sort of test this idea would be to say, well, what if we tell the participants that the person giving you trial to trial feedback is perhaps messing with you? They're a prankster, they're a joke star. And so maybe the feedback that you get from, the, from a trial to trial basis is actually unreliable. Um, and if you do that, everyone sort of goes back, not everyone exactly, but most people go back to behaving like they did in the no feedback condition, right? Which kind of makes sense. You basically give them a way of explaining away the weird feedback they're receiving, and therefore they go back to the way of doing the task they had before. The other thing that we tried was to go the, the other way. How do we get people to do the unrelated thing? How do you get them to make that extra last jump? And so we reconstructed the task as a weather prediction task. We said, what you're looking at, these images, are blue represents rain and orange represents no rain. And you're trying to guess whether or not it's raining or if it's going to be dry. Right? And the images you're looking at are from today. But you have to make a prediction either soon, like in the next couple of days about the weather, or a month away. And the idea was that if we tell people that the deterministic and probabilistic conditions are about the near future, but we tell those unrelated condition people about the distant future, then maybe we'll get more um, people. And this graph's uglier because this is more recent data because we only just did this. But basically, there is now far more of a difference between the probabilistic and the unrelated condition. Indeed, again, the fact that this isn't, if you look at individuals, about 25 out of the 30 participants look like flat lines. They, they realize things are unrelated and they respond as such. They ignore the stimulus because they've got a good reason to ignore the stimulus and just go on like, well, what are you telling me? Is it going to be mostly rainy? Is it going to be mostly? And they just try and guess, I think, what, you know, 70% of the time will be the correct answer. And the only reason it's got this curve at all is because a few of the participants didn't do that. And so they, they walked the average. And so where does this get? go back to that original sort of idea about bias in decision-making. So what is bias? So I think what we, the conclusion we came to is that these choices are basically just, they're just a consequence of a particular explanation um, of a decision environment. And those explanations or that understanding of what I have to do in this experiment are something that's created by each person in each new experiment. And I think the consequence of that is that we were misguided to think that there would be a general or commonality or universal idea or, or explanation for what bias is. It's going to be specific and it's going to be related to the experiments and the particulars of those experiments as they're created. Now that doesn't mean that there's no such thing as systematicity, right? Like they're within a paradigm. It may make sense to think about why a bias is happening, but I just, I can't, unless, Whenever there is systematicity, the way I should say it, it's going to be because certain representations or understandings of an environment are just going to be more likely to be created spontaneously by people because they share background knowledge, they share assumptions about how experiments work and all these sorts of things. But that's going to be the reason that systematicity, or there's, there's, they, they respond to feedback in particular ways and so on, but it's not necessarily going to be because there is this underlying general property of what bias is um, which is kind of what we were hoping to find. The, 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 like Hank said, I'll propose, there would be this just nice reason that bias exists in experiments. I just don't think that's, that's true. Bias is really just a difference between what someone, how someone thinks the world works and how you think the world works. And I think this, this actually is surprisingly applicable um, to real world bias things. Right? Bias is, it is just a difference between what you think should happen based on a particular representation or understanding of the environment and what is happening. But it's then wrong to conclude, like we thought we were going to be able to do, to say that that bias comes prepackaged with an explanation as to why it exists. So, because any bias you observed, it could be happening for any number of reasons, right? We were hoping that we would be able to find 
the reasons that it happens. Um, but I just don't, well, I think what we, given the way that it seems to manifest in tasks, which is that people try and work out what's going on, that implies how they should behave. Different people can create different kinds of representations. There's no reason to expect that there'll be this one true kind of bias. Right. And of course, this is hugely important because what you should do, for example, to get rid of bias, then depends on why it's happening. And if you get that wrong as to why a bias exists in reality, and you try and treat the wrong thing, it won't go away. Right? So the idea is what we have to get in, sort of in application, we have to understand why the biases that are happening that we don't like, why they, they are there in order to develop appropriate treatments. Like, you know, this is obviously a silly analogy, but like, like in the prankster experiment, once you gave participants a way of explaining, fixing their broken representation that caused all that bias, behavior went back to being just evaluating the stimuli. Right? And it's, it's because we kind of, you know, that, that what, I, what I mean to say there is that that doesn't mean that prankster, uh, you know, assistance or saying that the feedback is unreliable will always get rid of a bias. If it's there for different reasons, that won't be a general fix, even though it worked really well in that particular experiment, because you have to get it why it's there in the first place. But yeah, that's it. Thanks. Yep, thanks a lot for the talk. Very interesting. So I think we still have about five to ten minutes for questions. Let's have a look if there is something on the... Yeah. We've got some here. <laughs> oh, we, we have... Should we maybe um, start with one from the chat? Because they're already um, 20 minutes ago. Is that okay for you? <laughs> okay. So Mani's asking, is it correct to map this as a nonlinear drift rate, perhaps driven by positive feedback? As it happens, yes, of course, like the, the positive feedback turned out to be the thing that, yes, moved people around and the non-linearity of the drift rate um, is, is one way of doing that. I think, of, of course, now the, the conclusion is certainly not that that's what's always going on, but you wouldn't rule out that there aren't certain experiments and situations that you could create that would have the properties that the Hanks et al, et al model said would happen, right? The idea, I think, here is that that might be happening in certain situations. It's just incorrect to then think, as we did, that that might be a general reason for bias. I think the second Thanks. question in the chat is very related. Um, I, maybe I can quickly still say. Do you mean, Alex is asking, do you mean nonlinear evidence accumulation drift rate is supposed to model the average rate of evidence accumulation. So being linear, nonlinear is not a property of this statistic. But if you do, you can make the, the drift rate nonlinear. It can just, you know, if you break it down to like a, a, a differential equation, you can still have the change in accumulation that's being caused like some, by some systematic thing like the drift rate. It can also be a function um, of time. And so in a, in a sense, you can like in, in typical form. Yes, absolutely. It's supposed to be an average, but that doesn't, that's not like something that has to be true in the class of models that is evidence accumulation models. Cool. So then let's come to the questions from the room. Yeah, just to go first. Just could be wondering what, how did you kind of incentivize your subject in particular with the prankster research assistant? Why did they go back to answering? Like they wanted to give the right answer versus trying to guess what the prankster put in. Yes, um, that's true. I don't know why they went back to, as opposed to just guessing what the prankster did. So um, they, oh, no, sorry. There was a cover story about like, you're a research assistant in a field and you know, you're shouting down to someone in a pit and or you're shouting up about what you see to someone and they're telling you whether you're correct or incorrect, um, but they're reporting your results onto someone else and recording them or something like that. And so in reality, regardless of what they're saying, you really should just say what you see, what you see, because that's what really matters, I guess, in the context of the cover story. But yeah, you should be able to create a world where they instead play into the games of the of the prankster for sure. And incentives are just nothing. Have on the back and reason and credit. I actually had exactly the same question, but I was also wondering if. Um... Or the so I'm, I'm having a bit of difficulty translating the drift rates to reaction times. So I was just wondering if for the unambiguous trials, the reaction times are also generally higher. Yeah, uh, faster. 
Uh, yes. So, and it's the way to think about it is simply like a larger drift rate means that on average you'll head to the to one of the boundaries faster than the other. And you can think about it even if you just think like if it's if it's flat, like as you're afraid of zero, and you equally go up and down often, e equally often, which means that it will take a really long time to happen to get to the point where one response gets more evidence. And so typically faster, larger drift rates correspond to more frequent choices and faster responses and less variance in the response time distribution as well. I've spoken against this uh, theory from the paper in and of itself, because the paper theorized that if you take longer, you assume that you don't know, and so you, then your drift rate goes up with yes. this. It's because you have this mix of, it only is true in, in, in situations where you have a mixture of hard and easy trials, for example, and because what because the harder the trial is, the lower the drift rate, the smaller the drift rate, which means the slower the responses. And so what you essentially get in a block of trials is some easy ones where you're really fast and accurate, and then other trials where you're slow and inaccurate. And that creates essentially the confound between time and accuracy that if you're sensitive to it, you could, you could then use to, to motivate a behavior. So there is another question in the chat by Yofa. So the question, two, actually it's two questions. So the first is, what does the in-subject study reveal? Isn't bias very different person to person is the first question. Yes, so the, the yeah. Uh, this is, I think this is like, um, Within a particular domain, you would expect person-to-person -person biases just because of differences in their physical perceptual processing structures, but also on their, um, you know, what they think is going on in the experiment or how they should respond. I think the, the, the hope that we had was that there would be things that would sort of biases that would be consistent and predictable, essentially, at that sort of higher level, even even if we're now talking about these kind of weird experiments where the this you're sometimes supposed to respond against what the stimulus is showing and, and that kind of thing. Um, however, there will still also even down at that more specific level, yes, there will be person to person differences in the systems that will therefore present as different biases across different people. Um, and yes, there's lots of specifics about colored dots and groupings and crowdings and all sorts of things that happen in experiments like that that I know absolutely nothing about. Um, we literally just make some stimuli and paint and then give them to people because it doesn't matter for our purposes. Um, if you really cared, of course, about explaining the effects of grouping and things like that on the biases in responding, then it would absolutely matter. And you would have to know a lot more about that than we do. But yeah, for our purposes, I don't think that stuff was a lot important. So there is one more question by Eric, who's currently carrying a baby <laughs> while he's typing. So let's see what he's asking. Have you considered modeling the emergence of bias? Right now, the data seems to mostly track whether or not a bias appeared, but perhaps looking at how people learn to bias accumulation from differently helpful feedback signals could perhaps be captured by some form of Bayesian inductive bias. Yeah, so this is one of the things that we want to do now. So what, what I think, so the, I, would, I would, maybe we can have a long conversation at some point about why I don't think it's going to be as simple as some form of Bayesian inductive bias, but that's a whole other long discussion, I think. the. However, the idea of trying to model the process of these biases forming, I do think is an important part, right? So at the moment, the danger with what we're saying or the problem with what we're saying is going on here is that it's very hard to test and it's, very, it's not very specific as to what you should expect in any given experiment, right? And I, so, and I think we're making the claim that like, really it's the representation and the understanding that's being created and built, and that comes first, and then there's some consequence for behavior, or they they evolve together. But you know, the the idea is that this is like a that most of these tasks, even ones as simple as this, is still like an internal model selection problem for the for the participant. However, most models we have have a, like most explanations and theories we have in psychology are 
here's the model for how this is done. And I think we're saying like, no, no, that a lot of a lot of the problem is where those models come from, how they end up being constructed. And I think the next then step in this sort of research line is to try and work out, well, how do you do that? How, how, what is it, for example, that causes the, how, can you model that process where they see, no, you're wrong after looking at a blue stimulus that then changes how they start behaving for a little while as they try and explain what's going on or construct some idea. How can you construct feedback that would actually, feedback in the experiment itself that would lead them to the realization that the stimuli and the responses are unrelated to another? I assume that there's some yeah, sequence of feedback you could give that would make someone realize like, huh, this has nothing to do with what I'm supposed to do. It's just that when it's random from trial to trial and we don't have any control on it, they're, like, you know, the, per the person won't have that idea. So yeah, trying to model that process of what, what it would, be that would cause someone to have the idea beyond that sort of broad cover story that we had. Yeah, I do think it would also be very informative. So the idea that this is like very depending on a person, um, the idea, isn't that something then that you could try to manipulate um, with, with across different conditions and instruct people with certain cover stories or? Yeah, that's, that's where we had a preliminary go at. But like the idea would, be, there should still be some systematicity to that, some to, to the, what kinds of explanations people will come up with. So yeah, indeed, trying to understand it at, at that level. Absolutely. Okay, so I think we're actually already two minutes over, but we are also started two minutes late. <laughs> so I think that's uh, kind of a good point to stop. Thanks a lot for everyone to listening and also to you for the very interesting talk. <laughs>